In the early days of basketball, players used a soccer ball to play the game. In 1894, a special basketball was designed. It was laced and larger with a circumference that was about four inches greater than the soccer ball. For players, the new ball was a game changer. Basketballs have evolved, but one manufacturer still makes them the old-fashioned way. These laced brown leather balls honor the beginnings of the game. To make this traditional basketball, a craftsperson cuts eight panels out of tough American cowhide. These are rough cuts. The shape will now be more precisely defined. He places a sharp steel die on one of the panels. Using a tool known as a clicker press, he applies pressure to drive the die through the leather and punch out the shape, cookie cutter style. He now cuts strips of nylon to a workable size using a utility knife. The craftsperson then stacks up a dozen of the nylon strips. Using the clicker press and same die, he cuts out patterns. Because nylon is softer than leather, he can punch out many more at once. He places one of the nylon patterns on the underside of a leather one and stitches them together. The nylon backing stabilizes the leather, preventing stretching. He now punches lace holes and notches in the nylon padded leather panel. Using a template, the craftsperson locates the spot for an air valve hole and nicks it with a sharp tool. He places a punch on the nick and strikes it with a hammer to cut out the air valve hole. He clamps a stamp of a company logo in a heated press. As the stamp heats up, he moves it into a downward position and then slides the leather panel under it. He lowers the hot stamp and it burns the company logo into the leather. Next, with the liner side up, he sews the basketball panels together, two at a time at first. Doing this right takes practice. The craftsperson then trims the polyester thread and then pounds the thick seam flat with a hammer. He sews vinyl reinforcements to the two panels that have lace holes. This will give the laced area of the basketball more structure. The stitching will also frame the lace holes from the leather side to define and accentuate the lacing. He adds another strip of vinyl. This one will protect the inflated bladder inside the basketball. He assembles the panels four at a time. He leaves the section around the lace holes open to provide an entry point for the inflatable bladder. He stitches the two halves together, again working from the inside of the ball. This completes the basketball's outer casing. The next craftsperson places the basketball casing on a steel post and pulls and tugs the casing to turn it right side out. He now inserts the synthetic rubber bladder into the basketball. He manipulates it so that the bladder's air valve lines up with the corresponding hole in the leather. Using needle nose pliers, he grabs the air valve and pulls it through the hole. The craftsperson then rearranges the inner flap so that it's in a position to protect the bladder from the lacing. He partially inflates the bladder. Using a thick brass needle, he pulls a rawhide strip through the holes to neatly lace up the opening. He then fully pressurizes the basketball, and the pressure from the bladder holds the laces in place. He simply clips the end of the lace and tucks it in. A replica of the original, this leather basketball is ready to bounce back. The oldest shoe archaeologists have ever found is a 5,500-year-old leather hide moccasin with leather cord laces. 
Today, we don't have to go hunt an animal to lace our shoes. We can buy our shoelaces ready-made in a variety of materials, styles, lengths, and colors. This company produces shoelaces and shoelace type drawstrings in a wide range of materials, including cotton, rayon, and acrylic. This run is producing polyester shoelaces. A worker installs cones of fine polyester thread on what's called a creel, which feeds the bobbin winding machines. She groups the strands from eight cones and feeds them through one side of one machine and onto a bobbin. Then she groups the strands from another eight cones and feeds them through the other side of the machine onto a second bobbin. Each group of eight strands will produce one thicker polyester thread. She programs the machine to wind a specific length of it. Each cone holds enough fine thread to wind a 71 mile long thick thread. For this particular shoelace, the machine is programmed to wind 8,200 feet of thick thread per bobbin. Another worker installs 20 of those bobbins on a braiding machine. For each one, she passes the end of the thread through three eyelets, the second of which regulates the tension of the thread. She gathers half the threads and ties knots in them so that they'll catch when she feeds them into the machine. She starts up the braiding machine. It draws in the knotted threads, which pull in the unknotted ones. Then the machine begins braiding a continuous round shoelace cord. These wheels apply tension to pull any loose braids tighter so that the cord diameter is uniform. The finished cord, which is about a mile long, collects in a barrel. Some shoelaces are made of knitted rather than braided cord. The cones of thread feed the knitting machine directly. The machine's four latch needles can perform two types of knitting stitches to produce round cord. Once the knitted or braided cord is ready, a worker adjusts four metal pegs of a winding device to the shoelace length they're making. Then she winds the cord around the pegs, up to 250 times, depending on the cord diameter. She cuts the end and ties the cords together so that she can easily transfer them to what's called a tipping machine. She runs the center of each cord over an acetone-saturated felt pad, then inserts it in the machine's die. The die wraps a piece of acetate film tightly around the cord, then cuts it in the middle, producing a shoelace with a stiff tip called an aglet on each end. This press applies a nickel-plated steel tip, a kind used on bag drawstrings. The worker manually positions two tips directly on the cord with a slight gap in between them. She activates the press to force them on, then cuts the cord in the gap. Mascots are supposed to bring luck. But the people who wear mascot costumes have had a few lucky breaks themselves in recent years. The outfits are much lighter now, and there's even an exhaust system complete with a tiny fan inside the head, so it's not so hot in there. That helps the mascot keep his energy up for the entire game. This dinosaur mascot for the Lung Association is part of a new breed. It's really evolved into something that's relatively easy to work in. To make this dinosaur, they sketch him out. Then the artist modifies the figure to human proportions, targeting a height of 5 foot 10, which means the costume would fit performers 5 8 to 6 foot tall. The artist designs huge eyes and a very extravagant mouth, and not just for creative reasons. The large openings will give the mascot performer room to see and to breathe through screens. 
Now a sculptor carves big pieces of lightweight, uncrushable foam. With a utility knife, he shapes the dinosaur's head based on the design pattern. Traditionally, fiberglass has been used for mascot heads, but foam is half the weight. He attaches a battery pack to the inside of the head at the back of the neck using Velcro. He tests it to make sure it has enough juice to power this tiny square exhaust fan, which is to be placed inside the head at the top. Then he sprays glue on the foam, sticking the sculpted layers of foam together. Now the dinosaur head is starting to shape up. He cuts out those enormous eye holes. Then he tries on the head for size. He checks visibility and ease of movement. Next, the sculptor slices into a very dense piece of foam. It's dense because it will need to hold up to heavy traffic. This is the dinosaur's foot. He scoops out foam in the center of the foot, hollowing out an area. Then he carves out more following a pattern of a size 12 shoe so that a human foot could fit inside this big mascot claw. He rounds the outside of the foam foot with a belt sander. Now the foot is fully sculpted and ready for the fabric department. There, a worker sprays heavy-duty glue onto the outside of the foot and stretches a nylon fleece fabric over it. The fabric has a lot of give so that it can be tightly pulled into the grooves of the foam. Now she sprays adhesive onto the bottom of it and cuts off the excess fabric. She sews the seams with a very tough thread. Then a worker glues a rugged rubber sole onto the bottom of the dinosaur foot. This is a toenail made of nylon stuffed with polyfill. It takes three hours to make a foot. Now it's back to the other end. He glues an eye onto the mascot head. The eye is made of breathable nylon stretched over a plastic frame. Another worker sews on a horn which is made of fabric-covered foam. Then she stitches on the nostrils. And now the mascot has some expression. But there's one more step. He glues a white nylon screen over the mouth and sticks black fabric strips over it to give the mascot its smile. Now a worker drafts a pattern for the outer body. It will go over an inner body suit that will give the mascot its rotund shape. She cuts the liner fabric for the outer body following the pattern, and then follows the same pattern for the outside fleece. She sews three layers, fleece, foam, and liner all together. This serger machine cuts off excess fabric and it sews and binds the edges. She hand stitches the scales onto the back of the dinosaur mascot. And now it's time to give this mascot suit a test run. It fits like a glove. But what's the view like from the inside of that head? Hmm, not too bad. This dinosaur mascot suit is ready to help its user excite the crowd. In the beginning, megaphones were simply cone-shaped devices that focused sound forward so it went further and could be heard more clearly. In the 20th century, microphones, an amplifier, and a speaker were added to the cone, and that really ramped up the volume. With a megaphone, there's no need to shout. Just speak and you will be heard. This waterproof version is designed for coaching, law enforcement, and military uses. Production starts with a panel of four digital circuit boards that have little gold pads on them. An assembler places a stencil over the panel and aligns the stencil holes with the gold pads. He then squeegees solder paste down the stencil and it flows onto the exposed gold pads. This is before and after the solder paste application. Robotic arms install electrical components on the solder-coated pads, creating circuitry. 
Various reels unwind to deliver these little parts. The robotic arms suction them off liners and transfer them to precise locations on the boards. The parts will run the megaphone sirens, horns, and microphones. A technician clamps one of the completed circuit boards in a tester. Spring-loaded pins underneath make electrical contacts with the components and probe their performance. The system runs a full test of the circuitry. At the next station, an assembler attaches a part known as the front can to the end of a flared speaker cone. He then turns his attention to the speaker. The assembler inserts screws in the base. He threads wires from the speaker through a hole in the cone and through the front can. The assembler then places the speaker in the cone and he screws it in place. He attaches a connector to the protruding speaker wires. The worker places a mesh metal screen over a hole in the rear can. The assembler taps a nut driver with a hammer to force the mesh into the hole, and this shapes the mesh into a microphone cover. He removes the newly formed mic cover and fits it to the mic, manually crimping it around the sides for a snug fit. He now tucks the microphone into a tube that has a sliding inner sleeve. The assembler inserts the tube into the microphone hole in the rear can. He slides the inside tube down to push the microphone in the hole. He secures the knob for turning the megaphone on and for adjusting the volume. The assembler installs a mini circuit board that's linked to the siren and horn button. These small spring pins will mate to a battery to power the megaphone circuitry. He tucks the pins into molded protrusions inside the rear can and waterproofs them with rubber O-rings. This megaphone subassembly is now ready for the main circuit board. The assembler threads wires for the switch trigger, microphone, siren, and horn through holes in the board. He then screws the board to the rear housing. He fits a silicone O-ring around the rim of the rear can to seal it. The assembler then joins the rear can with all the working parts to the front can and cone assembly. He connects the speaker wires to the circuit board. This megaphone is now ready for a sound test. The technician connects it to a temporary battery and powers it up. Check, one, two, one, two, check, testing, testing, one, two, check. More sensitive testing is needed. He encloses the megaphone in an insulated chamber to shut out background noises. A computer runs the megaphone at different frequencies and analyzes its performance. Once the megaphone passes these tests, they install handles. And now it's ready for anything you have to say.